Amen. Are we ready to worship the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. All right. Grace that taught my heart. 
Here's the melody. So y'all sing with us, okay?
Welcome to the Parent Adventure, preparing your kid for a life with God. In session one, we're going to let this adventure begin. We're going to give you some practical tips on how you can build your own personal parent adventure plan. Plus, we'll be using God's Word as our guide as we plan this adventure together. So you ready? Let's get going. morning parent. And I'm Selma, the slow to get started in the morning parent. I used to drive our girls crazy when they were real little a long time ago. And early in the morning, we'd drive them to church or to school, and I'd sing these cheery little songs to them just to wake them up. They loved it. Huh, the morning daughter loved it. <laughs> the not-so-morning daughter could have killed you. <laughs> our morning daughter is Natalie, and when she was just a small toddler, she would come into our bedroom early in the morning, crawl up in bed with us, climb on top of me, pry my eyes open, and in that cheery morning voice, she would say, good morning, Mommy, I'm hungry. What's for breakfast? Oh. Uh, I think every family has uh, uh, morning people and not-so-morning people. The fact is that families include all kinds of unique personalities, gifts, and abilities, and when you put all those together under one roof, it does make for an exciting time. We want to welcome you to the Parent Adventure, preparing your kid for a life with God. That word adventure, it means an experience that includes both excitement and danger. 
And those of us that are parents know that parenting is a little bit of both. Exciting? No question. Dangerous? Often. The excitement and anticipation of the birth or adoption of your first child uh, is beyond words. I mean, all of us can remember with vivid detail how we first felt when we uh, laid eyes on our child. Mm, it's a beautiful experience. The, the, the miracle of life leaves us beyond emotion. Oh, Rodney, I can remember so clearly when both of our girls were born. With our firstborn, Jennifer, I'd been in labor for 26 hours. But when we held her, all that faded away. Rodney and I were so excited, we were laughing and crying all at the same time. And loudly, we kept saying, it's a girl, it's a girl. We're parents. We have a daughter. And not long after the miracle of parenting settles in, reality settles in as well. Reality in the form of danger and excitement. Let's talk about some of those realities. You know, maybe one of the best ways to think about this parent adventure is to think about the family car. I mean, how many trips do you take with your kid in the car? Rodney, can you think of any trips we took with our girl? Can I think of any trips? Oh, how about trips to the pediatrician? How about those ballet and gymnastics classes? Little league ball trips. How about all those haircuts? Family vacations to the mountains. All those first days of school? How about all those church trips? Oh, there were a lot of those. How about all those youth activities and youth trips? Uh, two very special ones I remember, getting learner's permits. Oh, and then those driver's license. College tours. And then recently, we've taken a pretty powerful family trip in the car to our daughter's wedding. I mean, from teddy bears to graduation caps, it seems like the phases of our children's life just go by in such a flash. I mean, we had them in our home for 18 to 20 years, and then we launched them in a moment. But more important than preparing for any car trips we've talked about, the parent adventure is about preparing your child for a life with God. I mean, helping him to understand that his creator has a plan just for him, that's got to be one of parenting's greatest joys. Oh, but how in the world do you prepare your kid for life? I mean, how do you even begin to pack for that adventure? Boy, that is so true. Anybody have any morning kids? Morning kids? Hey, we got a morning granddaughter. Because we took, uh, Kurt and I went up to work on the house uh, a couple of weeks back, and we stopped to see the, uh, our kids in Nashville, and we spent the night with them. And Ginger came bouncing in my room, as she always does, about 6 o'clock in the morning. Pops, it's time to get up. I said, really? I mean, we didn't get into about midnight, and I was just wiped out. She said, your friend's still asleep. I said, oh, okay. I'm going to wake him up. I said, no, 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 because he was downstairs on the couch. I said, no, no, don't do that. And she was out the door before I could even stir out of the bed. And she went down and put, it, what, your watch on your chest so to kind of wake you up. She already told me, she said, he's lazy. He's still sleeping. <laughs> Well, whether you're just starting out as a parent or you're well along the journey, here's one of the things you, you must have a clear sense of your purpose as a parent. Now, if you're taking notes, that's your first fill in the blank, and I'll leave the rest of them to you to find on your own, but they're pretty clear. So what do you hope to accomplish when it's all said and done? And when you've launched this child or all your kids out into the world of the unknown on their own, what do you hope? you're going to have accomplished by that time. In setting that purpose, what sources will inform the purpose? And what plan will you devise to get your kids where you believe they ought to be before they launch out? I was looking at some research from Lifeway Research, and only half of parents say their faith plays an important role in their parenting. Only half. Wow. That same research suggests that 14% of those parents that they interviewed say they are familiar with what the Bible has to say about parenting. Only 14%. Yet 83% of parents believe the parents should be responsible for the child's spiritual development. So here it is. If you don't, if, what is that, 86% don't know what the Bible says, but 83% says it's their responsibility to train. That's kind of an amazing paradox, is it not? Only 12% said their religious faith is the top influence on how they are to raise their kids, while another 23% call one of the most important factors. So add those two together, what do you get? You get enough parents knowing what the Bible says or how to apply it. That's what you get. That's uh, 
who say it's the top or one of the top influences in how they're going to raise their kids. So almost a third, by the way, of those that responded had no religious faith or said it had little or no influence whatsoever on them. So that's a pretty amazing statistic. It's kind of like those people in public life today who says, you can believe whatever you want, just don't practice it. What? Really? Well, what? Well, why have any faith if you can't practice it? Why have a faith if it has no impact whatsoever on the way you live life on a daily basis? Right? Is, what is it, a hell insurance card? You expect to, you know, pull it out in your pocket when you die and you go to God and say, got my hell insurance card, God, here it is. I was a member of East Hill Baptist Church, got baptized on such and such a day. It's not going to do you any good, by the way. I just want to let you know that. Um, Here's the kicker. Those who say they're more familiar with what the Bible says about parenting are more likely to have a parenting plan than those who are not familiar. And parents who have a plan generally have a more positive parenting experience than those without a plan. Now, don't raise your hand. Listen to me. Don't raise your hand. This is not a response question. This is rhetorical. That means you don't have to respond. Do you have a plan as a parent right now? If not, then this is your day. This is good for you because we're going to talk about that very thing. By the way, there is a move afoot to take the responsibility for raising kids away from the parents. Did you know that? You may not be aware of this, but Melissa Harris Perry, who's an MSNBC TV show host, was featured in an ad for MSNBC stating that children should not belong to their parents, but instead should belong to the community. I don't know if you know, I just thought we might ought to share this just in case you run across it out there somewhere. Here's her quote to be exact. We have never invested in public education as much as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is that we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to the whole community. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments, end quote. So do your kids belong to you? Did God give them to you? Or did the community birth these kids? Here's what I want to know. Well, I'm the one that paid for them. You know, I had to pay the, the doctor bill, the hospital bill. I have to go pay for their clothing. I have to pay for their food. When exactly are you going to do that for me if they belong to you and me? Right? Listen, if you think that's weird, you shouldn't. And I want to tell you just real quick, I'm not going to get in a lot of political stuff today, but I do want to tell you these things. Goals number 40 and 41 of the plan to overthrow the United States as extrapolated from what's called the Communist Manifesto, written in 1846 by Karl Marx and later exposed in the book The Naked Communist, published in 1958. Let me read these two goals for you. Goal number 40, discredit the family as an institution and encourage promiscuity and easy divorce. What do you think? Is that happening? How about goal number 41? Emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents. Attribute prejudices, mental blocks, and retarding of children to suppressive influence of parents. That happening? Listen, don't think for a minute that there's no conspiracy going on in our nation to move us away from the basis upon which our nation was founded. It is not an accident that we have the movements that we have today. Okay? Just want you to know that. So let, that's enough of that. But I just want you to realize, regardless of any modern trends or any communist influences, God gives parents the responsibility to raise the kids. And you are your child's primary mentor. The parenting adventure begins the moment you realize you're expecting your very first child. Not when he or she shows up, but the moment you realize it, you're going to have that child. At that point, though, it's not about the kids as much as it's about the parents. It's true. Specifically, it's about your purpose as a parent. Now, I know some of us have had a few kids by accident. You know, 
Some of us planned some. Some just kind of showed up unannounced and just said, hey, guess what? I'm here. But nonetheless, there's a purpose behind it all. It's more about the journey. When you realize you're going to have your first child, it's more about the journey you're embarking on than about the destination to which you expect to arrive. Because parenting is a journey. And hey, guess what? It's a journey with every new child. Because you are a first-time parent with every new child. They're not just cookie-cutter versions of the last one. They're a little different. Each one has their own uniquenesses. And regardless, you may say, well, that worked with this one, but that's not necessarily going to work with the next one or the next one after that. And there are similarities. I, we've got four. I've got two that are basically the same with different plumbing. And I've got two that are similar, but not quite. And then all of them have their own things that are absolutely, totally unique about them. And they all have things that you could say, boy, that's brothers and sisters. Okay? I mean, it's just that way. But unless you realize it's a journey, you'll not set a direction. You'll just react. And most parents these days are just trying to keep up. And it's nothing bad. It's not like it's, you know, they're the worst parent in the world for being that way. It's just a fact. You'll, you'll only be hoping the destination is somehow worth it. And all the trouble you go through makes some kind of sense when it's all over if you don't set the direction. Parents, you set the direction. Now, I'm not saying that you tell this child you're going to be a doctor and you're going to be a professional golfer and you're going to play baseball and you're, you're going to love to sew. That's not what I'm saying. But the parent direction, your direction as a parent, what you're going to wind up doing, how you're going to wind up raising this family, the, the, the goals and the basis for which you make your decisions as a parent, you set those things. If you don't, you'll just react. Most of the time, we will react in one of two ways. We'll either react exactly as our parents could, because that's all we know. Or we react the dead opposite of our parents, because that's what we know we don't want to do. Right? But if you don't deliberately set this thing, you're just reacting. And I want you to know, you will not arrive at your destination without first setting a course that will take you there. If you don't have goals as a parent, then you're never going to know where you're headed. And your kids are just going to grow up somehow. And you're hoping somehow it makes sense when it's over. Look at Deuteronomy. You get your Bible? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. One of those books right in the very beginning. Not the very beginning, but one of them. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1 and 7, and see what God says about the purpose of parenting. Here's what the Bible says. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, your, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently. You shall teach them diligently. You shall teach them how? Diligently, diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Wow. Primary purposes of parenting is fourfold. Okay, let me give them to you. You ready to write these down? Number one, your purpose as a parent is to help your children to grow into responsible adults. Does that make sense? To grow into responsible adults. 
I've known too many parents who thought it was their job to get their kids up and out of the house as soon as possible. It seemed like their kids were mere nuisances to them. They just couldn't wait for them to graduate high school. I had a friend that uh, his dad told him, said, son, the minute you turn 18, you better be living someplace else because you're done living here. Whoa. So he did. He went into the Marine Corps. So he found him another place to live that paid him. Tough job. Some parents really do look at kids like an infringement on their real goals. And these parents couldn't wait to get those kids out of their hair as soon as possible so they could go back to living real life. Listen, these little ones are going to become adults one day. Regardless of how little they are right now, they're going to become adults one day. Unless tragedy strikes, and we hope that won't be the case. Shouldn't it be the goal of every parent to prepare them for that day so they successfully assume the mantle of adulthood? Do you know any kids who are now grown up and they're now supposedly adults who still act like kids? Sure. And I think you could probably look back and say there's probably some parents back there who didn't know exactly what to do. So they just reacted to the best they could. Help our kids grow into adult, responsible adults. Number two, we're to develop them, uh, in them a positive outlook on themselves and a positive outlook on life. Okay? That's our goal, should be one of the primary responsibilities of our parenting. Well, now, we've not always been concerned about positive self-esteem issues in our country. And many today have no clue how to instill a positive outlook in their kids because they don't have one themselves, right? Know any negative people? I mean, it, it, listen, there's enough negative in this life. Angela and I were just driving in today. said, you know, we need to be, we need to get on a positive attitude. I was telling her, I think we're losing our country. I, th- I really think we're losing it. She said, well, let's get a positive attitude. I said, okay. I think we're positively losing our country. <laughs> she said, that's not what I mean. I said, okay, okay. Well, we got to have a positive outlook, right? We got to be able to look out and see things positively and build that into our kids. If we don't have a positive view of ourselves or of life in general, then our parenting adventure needs to begin right there at that point, developing a positive outlook, because we've got to instill that positive nature into our kids. Positive people will accomplish far more than negative people. The only thing negative people do better than positive people, you know what it is? Negative people will never be disappointed. <laughs> That's true. They, they can never be disappointed. They say, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. That's the truth. Number three, one of the goals or one of the primary goals of our parenting also should be to prepare them to receive the torch of family leadership. The torch of family leadership. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Listen, that's passing the baton of spiritual leadership, but it shouldn't it also be the same kind of thing with our kids so we can prepare them to pass on family leadership? Shouldn't we teach them how to do all the things that they need to be able to do to be a family leader? Sure. Don't just assume they're going to pick this up somewhere because they may not. Besides, that's not... Somebody else's job to teach your child about that kind of thing. It's your job. It's true. I look at that and I say, you know what? We need to get ready. Because there are things coming down the pike our kids need to be ready for. If we fail to pass the baton to them about family leadership, we've dropped one of the most important responsibilities of parenthood. Maybe they will discover it, maybe not, but that choice can have consequences that extend well beyond just the next generation. It could be generation after generation. That's the reason why the Bible says if you, this sin would be passed on to, up to the fourth generation. Why? Because that's kind of how it works. It's not necessarily that God's going to come down and say, smite that family with bad luck. No, that family built in that bad luck when they didn't teach them how to live the proper way. So that one teaches the next one, that teaches the next one, teaches the next one. It becomes a family curse that we pass along. Rodney Wilson was telling the story of when he was a member of high school four by 100 relay. 
at his school in Tennessee and on the track team. He, this is what he wrote, and I love this. He said, one year we were heavily favored to win the gold in the state meet. We were invincible, he said, and we could taste victory. All we had to do was qualify for the finals in the early heats. And I ran my 100 leg and passed the baton to my teammate, I was putting on my warm-ups when I heard an unusual sound, kind of a corporate sigh from the stand. And then those who ran against me started saying how sorry they were for our school. Our third and fourth runners had dropped the baton during the exchange, and our season was over just like that. He writes, parents have the responsibility to pass the baton to the next generation. Wow. We watched that in the Olympics one year, did we not? Our team just, I mean, we were just virtually a shoe-in for the gold medal until one of our guys couldn't pass the baton properly, and they dropped it, and then poof, you're out, you're over, it's all gone. It's not just about family leadership that we pass batons. It's about spiritual leadership as well. So, number four, our primary responsibility our primary purpose of parenting should be to instill in our kids a genuine and radical love for God. Listen to me carefully. I'm not saying these words out of an accident. A genuine and radical. Why? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's pretty radical, don't you think? That is the number one commandment. At least according to Jesus, I think that's pretty good authority. If he's the Son of God, God in the flesh, who came to live among us, would say the number one commandment is love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then I'd say that the number one goal of parenting is to instill in our kids a genuine and radical love for God. You'll notice our passage began with the first and foremost of all commandments, what the New Testament refers to as the great commandment, the command to love God supremely. And you'll also note, to whom does the Bible give the responsibility to instill that love into children? Parents. But let me also say this, dads. I know this is Mother's Day. But dads, you are the primary mentor in your family, not your wife. You are. You are the primary teacher. You're the primary example. You represent God in the home. And mom is there to help you do all those things that you need to do. But listen to me carefully. It's a joint effort between husband and wife. But guys, we're the top of that chain. Don't pass that off to the wife. Say, well, she's the spiritually minded one. Well, okay, well, you get spiritually minded then. Okay? Because you begin the chain. Parents are to be the primary spiritual mentors to their kids. And it's not the pastor's job. That's not my job. I don't mind teaching your kids. I love teaching. My kids would like for me not to teach as much. We have a little discussion on how to cook scrambled eggs, and I want to teach them. Okay, you start out by getting your eggs out, and you get to this bowl. Dad, I don't need that. Okay. But I'm just a teacher. I love to teach. But that's not my primary responsibility is to teach these things to your kids. That's your responsibility. It's not the Sunday school teachers, not the youth leaders. It's not the church's programs or the church's ministries or any outside camps or any outside retreats or any parent ministry groups. It's none of those people's primary responsibility. That belongs to the parent. You can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's your responsibility. We will help you do all those things to the best of our ability. We will give you resources to help you with all those things. But listen to me carefully. It's not our primary responsibility. That belongs to parents. The adventure begins when parents accept their God-given role as spiritual examples and teachers to their own. I believe the words of the Apostle Paul should echo in every ear of every parent, and it does in mine all the time. And here's what it says, quote, be imitators of me just as I am also an imitator of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Be imitators of me. So what that should say is I should be able to go to every one of my kids and say, Hey, listen, you want to know how to live your life? Imitate me because I'm, Im I'm imitating Jesus. Right? I know people who 
sing that song by Stacy Orico came out the song that says, if you're looking for perfection, don't look to me. He said, whoa, 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 don't believe that's what the Bible says. Then you're supposed to be able to look at me and see through me to see Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Same thing as parents should be able to look at me and see through me and see Jesus loving on my kids. It's the way it should be. It's more than just telling them what to do. It's demonstrating to them what to do. As Dr. John Maxwell said, you teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. That's a scary thought, isn't it? You teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. So what that means is, I need to do more than just say what's right. I need to learn how to do what's right. Then I can say to my kids, watch me, because do what I do. Too many of our parents send the kids out and said, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Rather than do what I would do. Listen, parents, parenting isn't for wimps. Amen? If you've been a parent for a while, you already know that. It, it can have its few moments when you want to throw your hands up and quit. Or you want to throw the baby out. Or you want to throw the teenager out. Okay? But there are hundreds of moments when the return on investment is priceless. There was... Once three workers laboring on a stone wall, and someone walked by and asked each of them what they were doing. The first answered, I'm laying block. So he went down to the next guy and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a wall. Went down to the next guy and said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm constructing a cathedral. Now, they were all doing the exact same work, but quite a difference in perspective. Which one do you believe loved his job? And which one do you think did the best at his job? You see, again, Rodney Wilson says, in parenting, we're doing much more than simply raising kids. We are touching the future. We are preparing our children for a lifetime adventure with God. We are impacting their children by the way we parent them. We are not merely laying parenting blocks. We're constructing cathedrals. Okay, you have your notes there? Look at the very last part of that page. Because every week I'm going to give you something concrete and specific that you can do as a parent to begin to change the way you've been approaching this whole issue. And I've given you something called the parenting plan. So here's what I want you to do. Sit down with your spouse and map out a plan. This is my plan for parenting. And if you've got kids that are up and grown sit down with your kids who have kids and say okay we need to explain something about how to make a parenting plan number one ask this question what are your core goals as a parent you and your spouse if you have still have kids in the home what's your core goal as a parent and write those out if you don't know what those are then you're reacting okay number two you need to ask yourself how do I expect to reach those goals. How do I expect to reach those goals? Does that make sense? What are my core goals? How do I expect to reach them? Well, I just hope that one day something will stick. No, not good. Not good. Okay. Now, none of us are perfect parents, and we all make mistakes, but you need to ask two more questions of yourself. Number one, am I doing my best to be the example I want my kids to emulate? Am I doing my best to be the example I want my kids to emulate? If not, then number two, what do I need to change to make that happen? Now, listen to me. Some of these changes may be minute things. Some of these may be honing or just kind of tweaking. Some of these may be huge changes. Like, well, I only go to church on three or four times a year. That's a huge change that needs to be made in your life. Well, why should I come sit in a pew and listen to some guy spout? Because God is talking during this time. I'm not God, but he's talking. Okay? He's speaking. You can tell that right now. And some of us are just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of us are white as a sheet right now saying, oh, God, I hope I make it. Okay? Listen, I'm just telling you. There's some things that will be minor changes and some things that will be major changes. And it will be that way for every one of us that are parents and every one of us that are grandparents. 
I think we need to change how we grandparent too, don't you? I don't think it's right that we just come and spoil those little kids and hand them back to mom and dad and say, now see what you can do with them. Okay? I don't think that's the right approach. I just don't. You know, even though you're wanting to punish your children for what they did to you, okay? Hey, your grandkids are punishment enough. So don't do that. So those are things I think you could do right off the bat. But let me also bring one more thing back to us. If you have yet to give your life to Jesus to get right with God, you don't really understand what life is all about yet. And you won't till you get saved. Now, I know that you have a lot of people out here talking all kinds of stuff out in the community. Oh, don't worry about that being saved business. That's just a bunch of religious baloney. It is not. It is life-changing. It will absolutely open up your brain to experience. Did you know that Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God? Did you know he said that? If you can't see the kingdom of God because you're not right with God, then how are you going to pass on the kingdom of God to your kids? You don't even know what it is. Okay? This is not something that can be understood in the empirical mind. The Bible says these things are spiritually discerned. That is, you can't, you can't grasp it just intellectually and fully understand it. It must be received spiritually, and then God, through the Holy Spirit, will open up all this understanding to you, and you can make the right application. Okay? So you've got to understand how this works. This is not just education. This is transformation. Are you with me? So parents, got any changes you need to make? Maybe yours is starting by giving your life to Jesus. If you're too proud to give yourself to, listen to me, if you're too proud to give yourself to Jesus, what are you passing on to your kids? Maybe they'll just be too proud to listen to anything you have to say. What kind of mistake are they going to be making? What kind of mess are you creating because you refuse to give your life to Jesus? So here's what we're going to do. You got the parenting plan. I want you to do that when you go home. But right now, I want you to get right with God. I want you to bow your heads with me. I want you to close your eyes. Please do not look around. This isn't about anything but you and God. If you have already given your life to Jesus, you know for a fact you're saved and you're going to go to heaven when this life is over. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for you. But would you pray a prayer out loud along with me? Because somebody near you needs to be encouraged to get saved today. And the Bible says, call upon the Lord while he's near. Today is the day of salvation. And God has come here to do business with some of you. And if you've yet to give your life to Jesus, you can do that very simply. The Bible says, if you'll just repent of your rebellion against God, place your trust in Jesus and ask him into your light and heart as your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. It says it this way. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer that expresses everything God's been waiting to hear from you. If, you. if you just pray it and mean it with all your heart. The words aren't magic. He's listening to your heart. So if you'll pray it and mean it with all your heart, you'll find that life will absolutely flip upside down and start making sense from this point forward. Christian, would you pray along with me? Those that are wanting to receive Jesus, would you go ahead and pray along with the rest of us? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I want to be forgiven. I put my trust in you to make me right with God. Come into my heart, forgive all of my sin, and save me today. Thank you for loving me, for dying for me, for rising from the dead for me and for saving my soul right now. In Jesus' name, I receive it. Amen. Father, I thank you for those that prayed of obedience to their pastor, but I especially thank you for those who just now gave their hearts to Jesus. And now, Father, fill them with your spirit. Give them spiritual understanding that only comes by the power of the Holy Spirit and, re, and by the reception of Christ. And now, Father, help us to be the kind of parents that raise the kind of kids that would be the least.